In October 1973, Brighton resident Adam Trimmingham was strolling along the seafront, bracing himself against one of the fierce storms that regularly batters England's south coast. As Adam continued his walk, what is now Brighton's last remaining pier came into view. This structure, built during the Victorian era, held many happy memories for him. Its charming old-fashioned slot machines, the long promenade over the sea to the end, and of course the ornate theatre that existed there for over 70 years, giving the pier its name, Brighton Palace Pier. But as Adam looked beyond the angry waves to the pier's end, he witnessed something truly horrific. Several buildings that should have been there had disappeared. The iconic theatre was lurching at an unnatural angle, like it might slide into the ocean at any moment. This is the story of the brutal storm of 1973 that changed the face of Brighton Palace Pier forever. The Palace Pier opened in 1899 as the third of Brighton's three piers. Its goal was as a pleasure pier to entertain visitors who came to Brighton in increasing numbers on the railway. Constructing piers at sea comes with unique challenges, but by this time dozens of piers had been built across England by screwing iron piles like these into the ground to form a solid foundation for wooden decking above. Despite this, the Palace Pier's opening was delayed for years by financial difficulties. Another problem was in 1896 when a storm completely destroyed Brighton's first pier, the nearby Chain Pier. Its debris washed into the under-construction Palace Pier, causing structural damage. The power of the seas was a continual challenge, but eventually the Palace Pier opened to the public in 1899. Two years later, its theatre became a magnet for anyone willing to walk the 500 metres to the end of the pier. The musicals, comedies and variety shows would entertain visitors for decades. But to understand what would lead to this theatre's eventual demise, we need to learn about one use of the pier that most modern visitors don't know existed. Brighton's coastline is exposed, with no natural shelters to protect it from the rough seas. This makes landing anything but small vessels on the shoreline tricky. But as it became a popular travel destination, the number of steamships arriving in Brighton soared. With no natural port, offloading these larger ships involved ferrying passengers on small rowing boats to the shore. There, they attempted to reach dry land without getting their feet wet. This undignified operation sparked the idea to build a permanent structure over the sea to safely offload passengers. All three of Brighton's piers were built with this purpose in mind. The Palace Pier, although primarily a pleasure pier, extended half a kilometre out to sea where ships could temporarily moor to metal platforms, known as landing stages. These landing stages at the end of the pier were accessed by stairs from the main deck above. Here passengers boarded beautiful paddle steamers with names like the Brighton Queen or the Brighton Belle to destinations such as Worthing, Littlehampton or even across to Dieppe in France. But many of these ships were lost during World War II. Then passenger demand shifted towards air travel or larger car-carrying ferries. With its natural deep water harbour, New Haven to the east overtook Brighton as the main passenger port. By the 1960s, Brighton Palace Pier was left with landing stages to which no ships ever moored. In 1973, permission was given to completely remove them, a decision that would change the face of the pier forever. Right up until 1973, the theatre continued to entertain visitors with shows like Music Hall at the Palace. For just one pound, you could watch several well-known artists of the time. Tell me, my little man, how are you this evening? <laughs> but this was the last show to be performed here. As laughter filled the theatre one final time, the disused landing stages were being demolished outside. Workmen made use of a 50-ton iron barge to safely access and dismantle the structure. For convenience, when this wasn't being used, it was more to the side of the pier. But on Friday the 19th of October, a storm began to blow and the heavy barge broke free of its mooring. The wind and waves washed it towards the main pier structure where it came into contact with the iron piles that support the decking and buildings above. As the danger to the pier became clear, the police contacted the army to request the barge's urgent destruction with explosives. But it was too late. Before they could attend, the barge had done its damage, then capsized and sank. The next morning's papers told the full horrific story. 
the Helter Skelter, the Crazy Maze and some decking fell first from the 73-year-old pier. Then a first aid post, a telephone box and a bar cellar plunged into the water. Part of the theatre at the end of the pier collapsed into the sea. In total, 25 piles were smashed by the barge. Photos taken at the time show the true extent of the damage to the theatre and surrounding buildings. Estimated cost of repairs, £1 million. Despite extensive work to fix the pier structure after the storm, the theatre was never restored to its former glory. In 1984, the pier was sold to new owners who focused on modernisation. By this time, theatre entertainment was in decline and two years later, the Palace Pier Theatre was removed to make space for new attractions. Today, the end of the pier has been expanded and features an amusement park above the waves. The ornate original gents' toilets is the only reminder of the theatre era that came before. Despite these significant changes, the Palace Pier remains one of the UK's most popular attractions with 4 million visitors every year. But without the theatre that once dominated the pier, people come for an entirely different experience. If the theatre still remained today, would you stroll to the end of the pier to catch a show? Or do you prefer the thrill of the more modern roller coasters? Let me know down in the comments.